it really shows that uh, although the, uh, when the guidelines were introduced, the use of high intensity statins in patients who were really indicated for it uh, was relatively low, uh, and that the guidelines have over time changed practice to the point where patients who are appropriate for high intensity statins are getting it at a higher rate, but the use is still quite low. I, I really calls to arms the need to uh, initiate and get patients on maximally tolerated high intensity statins for reducing cardiovascular risk and getting the appropriate patients on statins. So although we're getting there, we're clearly not anywhere close and hopefully uh, this is the first step in, in seeing physicians get patients on the right statins at the right dose. Well, I think they were revolutionary, right? They were a huge change in what we asked physicians to do. And I think at the beginning, there was a lot of controversy around them uh, in that it really did change practice. And it takes a while when you change practice, uh, one, to get people educated on the use of those guidelines. But the second is that um, you also have to have the patients come through the system. And so we're now seeing a couple of years where patients have rotated through, physicians and healthcare providers and, and, and mid-level providers have had the opportunity to make those patient decisions. They're seeing the benefits of that and they're seeing the, the ability to be able to get these patients on those doses and have them tolerate it. And, and I think that's extremely important. You know, the proof around statins is, uh, is, is unbelievably strong and we just need to do a really good job of getting patients on high intensity statins. I don't know, I think there's still, I think there's going to be controversy around this, but I think that the noise seems to be less. Uh, and um, it, I'm an N of one, so I can't tell you <laughs> what, the, what the world is saying, but I, I hear it a lot less. And as a practitioner, as somebody who had to learn how also to use, and I'm in, and I'm in the forefront of this, you know, I'm doing research in the area, I'm working with statins regularly, but I'm, I'm still a clinician. And as a clinician, it was a big learning for me. It took a while to figure out how I was gonna incorporate in my practice. And it was as disruptive to me as anyone else. And I can tell you as an NM1, it's gotten a whole lot easier as I've learned how to use it and figured it out. And I think that seems to be the gist of what I'm feeling in the atmosphere, in the environment at least. I think the, you know, the, the PCSK9 data highlights the need for getting cholesterol down and they were, studies were done on top of statins and it really does introduce the idea that you know, before you uh, really think about getting patients maximally treated, you should really optimize their statin first um, and really try to get them on the right dose. Uh, of statins, but the, I think they're synergistic. I think the PCSK9 data and the PCSK9s are quite synergistic in the, the goal of getting people to optimally treated lipid parameters and in particular optimally dose statins. I think we're getting there. I don't think we're there yet. I think there's still a lot of um, questions around um, triglycerides, around HDL, around other lipid particles. Um, I think there are, we have uh, uh, Epinova uh, has an ongoing trial, which is an outcomes trial, strength, um, and that is looking at cardiovascular outcome in the non-LDL subset uh, in patients who are treated for their LDL to see if there's additional benefits in those high-risk patients, and it would It'll go a long way for answering that question as well. I still think that is that water's pretty muddy right now.